Welcome everyone. The first thing I, I want to do is, is give you a little tutorial of how to use the GoToWebinar question um, uh, tool. And if you look at your GoToWebinar kind of overall toolbar, there's a line that says question and answer. It might be collapsed. And if it's collapsed, what you want to do is just click on the little triangle next to the Q, and then that explodes it out. And underneath, enter a question for staff, you can type. And when you hit send, um, it goes to the desk of Bentley Leon, who's in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And Bentley, would you say hi? Uh, hello, I'm in La Crosse. Great, thank you. And Bentley is going to be um, managing the question queue for us um, and basically be kind of your, um, your interpreter going from the written question to the verbal question. So during the time that we have together, even though we can't hear what you're saying, if you have a comment or want to ask a question, we certainly invite you to do that. And, um, and we will, to the best of our ability, include your comments and questions in the program. All right. And um, I invited a couple of special guests to the session today. We have uh, Martha Whitman, who is the board president at the La Manzanita Co-op in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Martha, would you say hi? Hello, everyone. Well, it's, and I, I should add that Martha has a very professional voice because she is a radio star in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> how do you like that? <laughs> Isn't that how you call your, is it radio star? Does that sound right? We're radio moguls. Moguls. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, also, we have Bob Noble from Weaver's Way Co-op in Philadelphia. Bob, would you say howdy? Howdy. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Bob actually is not on the board at the moment. He's in the, one of those periods of time that board members and board uh, leaders think about where they serve for a while and and then take a break. And Bob, I understand you're a candidate for for board, do you want to um, you want to do any campaigning while you're in your introduction phase right now? Well, well, I'm afraid nobody here on the line can vote for me. Unless we have some Weaver's Way members listening, but it's, it's possible you would know better than I do if yeah. there are any. Mark, yeah. well, vote for Bob if you have the option. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, without. Um, uh, too much more kind of introduction. We're going to launch right into it. We have a pretty full, um, pretty full schedule. But first, I want to just encourage you to look over the list of co-ops here that's on the screen. We have about, um, I think it's about 30 co-ops um, participating in the session, and um, potentially about um, 50 individuals. And I understand that there are a couple of groups. Who, uh, who are attending as well. So uh, we have a nice sized group for the session and I really appreciate your coming and hope that we do create good value, um, good value for you. Let's see, I'm just gonna go over that little tutorial again for the um, folks who just signed on. Um, we're using the GoToWebinar um, question and answer area in the GoToWebinar toolbar. And um, just to describe where that is, uh, there's a question and answer bar. And if it's just one line, click the little triangle thing next to it, and that explodes it out. And then you can type in the box that's answer a question for the staff and hit send. And we will be, um, we will be integrating your comments and questions into what we're presenting tonight. So we hope that you take advantage of that as you so desire. Um, so this session is one of 12 that we're producing uh, in 2008. It is called Acting on GM Monitoring Reports. Uh, we're, we're calling it uh, one of our CBL 200 series courses, um, Mastering the Fundamentals. And our idea there is that we'll develop uh, material uh, in the Mastering the Fundamentals section over time so that in the end, we really have the curriculum available for directors uh, to really create a solid foundation. And, and so far, we've named our, our other category of workshops uh, thinking and acting strategically. 
and we have uh, six this year in both categories. So it'll be also fun to watch to see what other categories we um, we come up with. I think Bentley, you suggested one called uh, uh, having to do with inspiration, and so I think that's that's a possibility for the for the future too. Um, you can find out more information there at the cdsfood.coop slash cbuild website. Um, let's see, how do you like that for, uh, this slide is not in your packet because uh, I thought that I should just quickly give an overview of cbuild and this is one of the online sessions. Uh, also we include a retreat, so one of our eight consultants will be coming to your co-op to facilitate your retreat this year. Um, we have the CBL 101 in-person sessions. Uh, so far in January, I think we had almost 100 directors attend four, four of those sessions in um, uh, four different locations. And online retreat, and lastly, it is the ongoing consulting hours. Thank you, Bob. Um, so our uh, eight consultants are divided up among about 63 co-ops this year, and we provide uh, support to you and your board leader um, as needed during the year, and we really encourage you to take full advantage of that. And especially on the content uh, that we're presenting today, all of us are are quite uh, able to um, answer questions, your follow-up questions, and help in, um, integrate some of the tools that we'll be sharing with you. Let's see, this next slide is, um, and I'm also watching, there we go. This is um, a list of files that um, are available on the, um, in the CDS file repository. Uh, for this workshop, and um, I just wanted to quickly go over them. We're going to look at uh, some of them uh, in detail during the session, but I thought I would just give you the quick overview. So the actual slides, the PDF file of the slides that we'll be looking at are available. Um, this was something that I just put up yesterday, uh, some sample language that you could consider using in your meeting minutes um, regarding um, accepting uh, reports. This is a delegation to the GM chart we'll be looking at. Uh, the calendar is a monitoring uh, schedule that's part of the slides. We'll be looking at that, but you could download it and modify it uh, to fit your schedule. Um, this is the decision tree that we'll be looking at. Um, we're not going to look at this really as part of the um, workshop, but there is the sample questionnaire that some boards uh, attached to their policies when they're uh, circulating with the directors and it helps the director answer the, um, the questions that are on the decision tree as they review the report. Um, here's a sample memo document that is used once a year when you're um, pulling together the, um, the board's decisions uh, regarding the uh, GM evaluation. And this is a handy spreadsheet that you could modify to keep track of the board decisions during the year regarding your um, regarding the board's actions on the uh, monitoring reports. Last but not least is the uh, Co-op Grocer article that uh, kind of describes the whole process from a director's point of view. And uh, if you uh, go to the video store and rent um, the Twilight Zone that will be good because it uses that theme music as part of the uh, experience. <laughs> Martha and Bob, do you have any? Uh, did you guys read that article ever? Or? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I did. hope we get to discuss a little bit of it during the session today. Yeah, did you did you use the sound effects though when you were reading the article? Oh, no. <laughs> that would have helped. Yeah, do do. No, no, that was in, it. Was in my head. It oh. came right back. Yeah, good. <laughs> All right, so anyway, those are all available to you as uh, since you've registered for the workshop, and it looks like there are a lot of files, and there actually are. Um, some of them are useful tools that you can modify so that you can just, you know, they're usable, and others of them would be more of a resor resource document for your, um, for your directors. Okay, 
um, here's how we're going to approach the work. Um, I really like to frame the whole idea of monitoring uh, and the board's actions on monitoring um, within the context of accountability. So we're going to just look at a couple of, of, uh, of pictures of accountability. Um, the whole process we're talking about today is based on the idea that um, the board is going to write down its expectations and, and, and I'm going to use expectations and policies um, synonymously tonight. Um, but anyway, the idea that you have pre-established criteria is really one of the critical um, kind of premises here because the reports coming back to you from the manager are only going to be in response to uh, the board's voice uh, or pre-established criteria. Uh, we'll take a look at the whole uh, cycle using the um, GM delegation to the GM chart. We'll look at how that spreads itself out over the course of a year. We'll actually kind of go through the um, use of the decision tree, not only using the decision tree, but also um, but also just like talking about the questions that are implicit there. And I've included a couple of examples, um, totally for illustration purposes, so that we can point out um, you know, a couple of the things that we're talking about when we're talking about a monitoring report. But I'm not really demonstrating um, monitoring reports today. We're really focused on getting our heads around the board's response to having monitoring reports. Um, in the end, we'll see how the monitoring reports connect to the whole GM evaluation process. So you can see that's quite a long list. Um, there are a couple of points that I want to just describe to us so that we can kind of hold them in the air in the room, even though we're in rooms all across the country. Um, the first is that accountability is different from being informed about everything that's going on. The next is that reasonableness is a great way to judge, and um, it's really the suggested method as opposed to any other standard of measure that you might be exploring. Reasonableness is the, is the standard of measure that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, that the monitoring process does equal the GM evaluation. and um, and kind of a subplot that you really need to be clear about is um, um, how the group decides stuff, how your board decides stuff. So those are four things that um, we're, we're not going to really talk about how the board decides stuff explicitly, but we will talk about what you know some of the challenges are. So we'll keep keep those things in mind. Um, Bentley, anything coming up yet that we should? be aware of or talk about before we launch? Uh, we had one individual that hadn't been able to, I think they just didn't dial in, so I've sent them a private note on that. Okay, with the phone number? Yep, so nothing so far. Okay, and um, great question there from Erica. I'll just steal that from you, Bentley. The, the uh, oh, too bad, Erica, you didn't mean to hit enter yet, but yeah, we're going to really dwell tonight on internal monitoring process coming from the GM. There'll be a couple of places where we can kind of uh, talk about the external process, but um, tonight we're going to really be focusing on the internal from uh, uh, responding to those reports coming from the GM. Uh, Bob and Martha, anything uh, from you guys before we get started? Um, I'll say for myself, I think I'd like to at some point talk about the difference between monitoring ends policy versus monitoring executive limitations. Oh, I love that. Uh, Martha, anything from you? Um, maybe just a thought of down the road around accountability and being informed. And uh -huh. I just had one thought there. OK, great. Thank you for those two comments. And Bob, oops, let's see here. I want to keep those. And I'm going to just flash up here. Um, this is not in your. Your packet it will take probably a second to um, get up on your screen. Let's see. Ah, there. I needed to do. Oops. One second. And 
there. Um, thanks, Bob. I, I did want to give this little infomercial. Um, and I'm showing a page that's not in your handouts. Uh, and it's and it's has uh, ends really big and executive limitations. And I'm just going to say this uh, forever until we just totally um, to just totally integrated into our our board and director lives. That ends our outcomes and equal organizational accomplishment results and for whom the recipients and these policies are the point of your organization. So um, this is where you want to spend your time. Uh, this is what you want to think about all the time, really, um, as much as you can. And your managers and staffs are organizing themselves to accomplish these things for you. Uh, executive limitations uh, are important. They are not the point. Um, they are conditions and activities that are unacceptable. So they really describe the boundaries um, within which uh, everything needs to take place. The interesting challenge is that we monitor the limitation policies all year long, and so they can tend to um, uh, really become the thing. And since they're not the point, uh, they ought not become uh, the thing. So I wanted to just throw that out. We will talk about a little bit later the monitoring process and the decision making around uh, ends monitoring. But in order to do that, we first have to kind of lay out the, the groundwork that um, they are the most important things. And we do need to have a way to measure accountability for limitation policies, but not have it be consuming us. So uh, sorry for that diversion. Um, now, well, let's see. I have to, sorry, since when I change programs, I have to remember to change my little thing here. OK, so um, accountability chain, setting the stage. So a cooperative, I mean, yeah, this is going to seem really basic, but this is a really important way to start the conversation. Um, cooperative is an organization, an enterprise owned by and operated for members for the purpose of producing some common benefit slash value. What is accountability? Accountability is a quality or state of being accountable. And what is accountable? Giving a justifying analysis or explanation to prove a trust is fulfilled or an obligation is met. So the reason that I think this is such an important place to start when we start talking about monitoring is that we're talking about being accountable and we're talking about a justifying analysis for a trust being met. And we're not talking about how to do the manager's job, right? This is about the, um, this chain uh, here saying that, look, we know we have member owners. In some cases, we have, you know, let's see, in our list, maybe a, from a few hundred to, to you know, 10,000 members. So we have a, a big range of membership in our co-op. We're going to assume that they all don't agree on everything. And yet they have delegated to you, the board, um, to be their authorized agent. You are, in turn, delegating to the GM. And we're going to really explore that tonight. And the GM isn't doing everything. The GM is doing a lot of delegation. And the point of all this operation stuff is that there is value produced for the member owners. So. Um, that is the kind of the empowerment chain. And then what we want to do is say that um, we need to make sure that the value is actually produced. Obviously, internally, there's going to be uh, checks on how things are being done. But today, what we're really focused on is this link right here between the GM and the board. The point of really having this link be solid is so that you can stand up in front of your members and be accountable for all of this action here, and that the members are actually getting value produced on their behalf. So I really like this picture because it helps clarify what the point is of the monitoring process. Sometimes we, get, we can get off track about, you know, well, what are we here talking about? And you always can come back to this picture 
just to help you see that, oh, we're actually here representing the members, and we need to be able to stand up in front of them and say that a trust or an obligation has been fulfilled. All right. The other interesting part that we're not really going to talk about today is that if you're um, really doing a bang-up job, you t you the board uh, defines what this value um, ought to be in advance, so that it's not just accidental value, and that that is done not in isolation as a board, but in cahoots with your membership. So that would be let's say uh, member linkage and including members in the dialogue about the purpose of the organization. And so any, uh, Bob or Martha, want to chime in on account, uh, cooperative accountability or the accountability chain before we move into the material? Not for me. Okay. Nothing to add. I think excellent definition. Okay. Thank you. And I lost my uh, sound meter here, so I'm just going to take a minor detour just to make sure that everything's fine like a little sound check and boom hello testing good thanks good news everything's fine <laughs> <laughs> all right so um Another very simple thing, people can get uh, kind of very see uh, policy governance or the board's role in policy is a very complicated thing. We're going to give you the super simple way to think about it. Hey, we have expectations, we write them down, we assign authority, that looks a lot like the accountability chain that we just went through. After that, we're going to have to check to see if our expectations are being met. So this process right here is the monitoring process, okay? So we set out the pre-established criteria, we gave authority away, we said, hey, we, you know, go crazy, do a great job with this, um, and, and then we have to check to see if we got what we wanted. And this idea that we need some information is the basic idea of what monitoring is about, all right? People say, you know, gosh, it seems so complicated, and this is it. That's about as complicated as it needs to be. Maybe, you know, slight, slight variations, but um, if you can keep it on that simplistic level, you'll have more interesting sidewalk conversations with your members. <laughs> um, so how do we actually start the work? We start the work by asking, what have we already said about this? And... This is a great question. It's very simple, but if you have, if your board has policies, you can ask this question and find answers to almost anything that's going on that your board is dealing with. So today the question is, well, gee, what's this monitoring process all about? And we're going to answer it first by looking in our board process policies um, and specifically the board GM relationship policies. I'm going to show you um, some policies that we have in our sample set and if you um, if you have policies that are organized in the way of having limitations and and uh, outcomes and and board process policies you will likely have some similar policies so I would suggest that that you um, open up your policy manuals and check out what yours have to say so um, this policy area is called the Board Management Delegation Policy Area, and it's talking about the governance management connection. So the first thing is, and this is the, the top level, all these policies are organized with the top level, and then in this case there's four sub-policies right here on this page. This one is saying that the Board's sole official connection to the operational organization and its achievement and its conduct will be through the general manager. Um, there are some other very important and interesting sub-policies about only the whole board, you know, has uh, uh, control over the GM, meaning that no individual director has any authority, um, that the GM is accountable for everything that's going on 
so there, there's no skipping uh, links in that accountability chain. Your focus is on the GM. The GM's focus is, is on everything, um, everything on the other side of the GM. Uh, and that you are going to write down, the board will instruct the GM through written policies. So that's your deal that you're making. Hey, we are actually going to, going to authorize you by writing stuff down. And then this one is the focus of this workshop, which is saying that um, we are going to systematically and rigorously monitor the GM job performance. All right. So we actually could just, you know, live with that right there. But in fact, in this case, in our sample, we wrote some more stuff down, and you probably did too. We wanted to give it a little bit more specificity. Um, and that is that the monitoring process is only about whether or not what the board has uh, set out as expectations, um, whether or not that has been met. So going back to that, having expectations, assigning authority, and then checking, that's what monitoring is about. So if you haven't written something down, you know, guess what? It's pretty hard to check. Um, if stuff's going on that, uh, that didn't merit, um, you know, a policy, there's not really a monitoring uh, process set up for that. Um, this next policy is saying that um, there are different types of monitoring um, uh, mechanisms. The one we're going to work on tonight is the one produced by the GM. In every case, the board will judge. So this is actually saying, hey, we actually figured out how we're going to decide stuff when it comes to these monitoring reports. We're going to decide stuff on the reasonableness of the interpretation, and we're going to talk about what that looks like and whether or not there's data, and if the data actually um, shows accomplishment. So right here in one sentence, we actually framed how the board is going to decide stuff. So this is really helpful if you're in a board meeting and directors have different interpretations about how it should respond to a monitoring report. It needs to be the, the test is reasonableness, and you're looking for data in order to know whether or not um, you can stand up in front of the members and say that you're good or not. Uh, so let's see. Here we say that um, the board is, is actually going to be the judge. All right, so yes, the test is reasonableness. Um, but the board is going to be, uh, the board as a whole is going to be the way we, we decide reasonableness. So each director, like, you know, the article that, um, that we included as a resource pack, in, 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 as a resource material for this workshop, the article is written as a narrative from an individual director's point of view. That person is giving the report the reasonableness test. Then you come together, and now you have, like, say, nine people all, like, testing out what they thought against the rest of the group. So, um, you know, the, the simplest version here is the individuals come together and find out that, hey, we all agree that this was all reasonable, just for example, and you're done. I mean, that's really the end of it. So uh, we're going to kind of talk about it on that simplistic level. Uh, let's see. The frequency and method is chosen by the board. So you're actually in control here. You know, you don't want to look at the system and say, gee, you know, we're stuck with this. The board could decide to change the frequency and change the method. Uh, and as we'll see, there's a calendar, and a lot of the uh, limitation policies are monitored annually. Some of them are even uh, every other year, and a few of them, or maybe only one of them, is quarterly. Um, you can change that. If something's going on, you say, hey, we actually need a monitoring report once a month on this until things, you know, are different. You have that, you, you have that authority. Uh, lastly is that the annual evaluation of the GM is based on the summary of monitoring reports. So um, here we're actually connecting the monitoring process with the GM evaluation. So we're got about to kind of pull out of the policy review. Um, I really like starting there because 
uh, reviewing your policies is the right thing to do after you answer the or after you ask the question, gee, what have we already said about this? So, uh, which is a great starting question. Um, Bob or Martha, any comments on uh, on the review of those policies? Do you guys have policies like that? Yes, oh, very similar. Yes, we do, and we caught ourselves on one. We weren't paying very close attention, realizing that the um, monthly monitoring was our evaluation, and that when we got to the year end, we thought, oh, you know how you're always supposed to do this evaluation and write a letter and praise the manager and then tell them what you want them to be doing for the next year, and it was ended up being out of line because we didn't write policies on those expectations. Yeah. It was just an old school uh, way of evaluating that we didn't click that, oh, we've been doing evaluations every month. Mm -hmm. and, to, uh, and we referred back to them, but we felt that we still were supposed to do this other piece. Mm -hmm. so it was nice to let go of that other piece when we saw what had happened. Yeah, because you actually had two different systems going on. You were doing the work right. every month during the year and then taking on the special project of evaluating the manager as a whole separate idea. I felt we had to come up with something new. New, yeah. That was never, that was never um, listed in the first place. Right. So a couple of points on that is I, I really like to, to kind of put out there that uh, board time is precious. It's a precious resource, and it's also finite. It's not unlimited. So, um, you know, now we want to say, well, what is the best way for us to use the time that we do have? And certainly uh, eliminating redundancies would be one way of actually having more time to do, to do good and important work. Um, so yeah, that's uh, not to mention that the made up uh, GM evaluation using some other system is, is um, often can be complicated and, and stir up a whole other set of issues sometimes, depending on what people come up with. Bentley, any, uh, any questions there that we would want to address before we move on. Whoops, Bentley, I can't quite hear you. Oh. I can't hear you at all. <laughs> speaker was in that. <laughs> I think we can keep going. I'm okay. trying to answer questions as we go. Okay. Um, I am going to now try and just click out of the um, the PowerPoint environment and get back over here so we can make this chart be bigger. And I'll just take a second here to click all the necessary. Um, let's see. We're looking at the board's delegation to manager chart. Okay, so um, and I'm just wanting to make this as big as possible uh, on your screen. So at the at the top center, we have the idea that the board has policies. It's written them down. Um, in this case, we're also acknowledging that there's two different types. One is about achievement and one is about avoiding what's not okay. And then this chart is set up to go uh, clockwise. So the very next thing that happens is uh, the GM creates um, operational definition slash interpretations. Now it's actually an interesting place to pause. Um, we used to always only say interpretation, that the GMs, in, you know, created interpretations. And um, we're starting to introduce this new use of language, operational definitions. And um, the reason uh, that I like it, and, and I'm not totally just making it up, we're, we're pulling it in from, from, uh, from good and valid sources, but I like it because the idea of operational definitions has been around um, for decades, and I, I, you know, I'm not really a good historian, but the stories that I've read um, was that it came out of uh, uh, physics, the, the science of physics, where what they were trying to do is is duplicate uh, experiments and really understand what process was being used so that it could be replicated. And so the the way it uh, uh, works in in our world here is that. What the GM's burden now is to take the board policies and, and interpret them and internalize them in a way that can be demonstrated. So if you said, hey, it's not okay to risk fiscal jeopardy, 
or hey, as an accomplishment, um, um, improve the access to local and regionally produced food. Um, what we need from the response is a, a way, a demonstrated way, that that's going to be integrated into the organization and measured. So um, in this next box, the, you can see it says make board policies measurable, use third party support when possible. What we mean there is um, a GM might bring a, a standard that's used in the world into the operational definition. So again, just as an example regarding, hey, it's not okay to risk fiscal jeopardy is a broad idea. The board might have been more specific and said, um, hey, it's not okay if you have inadequate liquidity. And in terms of measuring and, and operationalizing liquidity, the manager might say, hmm, I'm going to use the current ratio for that because that is a standard used in the world for measuring liquidity. So then when that comes back to the board, the board can um, use the reasonableness test on whether or not that's a good measure. And, and partly it's going to be judging um, the, the, um, uh, what third party support is being invoked for the use of that measure. Um, so then we have more delegation. And in fact, the GM, you know, we, we put the burden on the GM in this model for coming up with this, but in fact, uh, managers all across the country are including their management teams and staffs, uh, staff in coming up with these um, uh, responses to board policy. And you have more internal delegation leads to programs and activities. Here's all the stuff that's actually going on in the co-op. And then you see that, oh, not everything works out, so there's changes made. All of this, this, these dotted lines here are meant to imply that this is a very dynamic world and uh, your, meaning the owner's voice, the board voice, might have stayed the same over time and yet tremendous amount of, of, of dynamic activity happened underneath your voice, right? And you didn't, that wasn't your job and, uh, and yet it happened, um, it happened. So uh, lastly over here, data collection, which is connected to the GM's uh, interpretations. And then we come back into the board work color, which is that you're receiving those reports, you're, you're judging them, and then you're also a uh, subproduct of the monitoring process is doing a check on your own policies to see if they're the policies that you want. So that's a um, quick overview. Um, I wonder, Martha and Bob, have you, um, have you seen this chart before? And, did it mean anything to you if you have? Uh, I thought it was excellent. I, I wondered, uh, I saw also once upon a time a, another chart that looked more like a decision tree. Mm -hmm. I guess that probably That's coming uh, up. does something very similar to this. Yeah, the decision tree is actually helps the board go through the process of making the, you know, the, the steps of the, of the decision on the report. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one question regarding measurement, would you think that all board policies are measurable? Yeah, that's the premise. Okay. Yep. I think it's the job of the uh, general manager to tell you if it's not measurable, that you've set out an expectation, that we wait to hear from him or her, whether we've, otherwise we assume it is. Yeah, and you know what, I have uh, in the last year been very involved in uh, in creating some sample um, monitoring reports, and I didn't come across any policies that were unmeasurable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is the time you'd like to um, hear this, but we just did a, um, some in-depth look at operational definitions around fiscal jeopardy, and it was a very interesting exercise. Uh -huh. I don't know if this is the time. Well, well uh, sure, go ahead. What do you mean? Well, we have that policy, and you will not put us in fiscal jeopardy. And the interpretation, one aspect was a, a particular, you know, current ratio setting that, you know, we're okay if we don't fall behind X. And we challenged that. So how did you come up with X? What does it mean? And it was an interesting exercise in that um, the manager went out and went beyond the co-op industry and went into the grocery world and found what uh, current ratios that 
various companies operate under. Mm -hmm. So from Whole Foods to a, a conventional grocer, as well as data from the co-op world through Cocoa Fist. And um, it made us look, oh, look, they, they operate under much uh, a tighter uh, current ratio. But then someone pointed out, well, these are public organizations that can raise money fast mm -hmm. through selling stock. And so it's, it's not necessarily apples to apples. Mm -hmm. And so it was a great exercise in becoming informed about the industry, but it didn't really satisfy why, why is this a good ratio? Why do you say this is protecting us? And in the end, we sort of go with historic uh, data from us saying, we know that we can operate well with this ratio and stay out of trouble. Right. But going outside didn't really prove it. So it was an interesting exercise to educate us as well as see that it's not apples to apples all the time. Yeah, and you know, my, my comment on that would be um, there's, there's, two, there's kind of two ways to think about a measurement. One is, like you said, what, what should be, and we're going to, you know, the one example that I have actually is using that, um, is, is, is uh, using the current ratio, so we're going to see it in a picture, but where do we draw the line when we're creating a boundary that is uh, in, intended to describe avoiding jeopardy, right? And mm -hmm. then diff a much different idea is what is the strategic uh, development of this measurement over time in order to ensure that we accomplish what we can accomplish? And, and so you would really only be looking at uh, the first idea in a limitation monitoring report, mm -hmm. and yet in the long-term uh, 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 outlook regarding a, a planning policy monitoring report or an ENDS uh, policy monitoring report, you would maybe expect to see the dynamic play between increasing uh, your financial readiness and then making some you know, investment, having that impact a measure like current uh, ratio, and it's going to be a dynamic thing, but it's going to be about, it's going to be connected to accomplishment. And, and all that sort of and, comes and, out in your Lego. Book. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then the idea is that, and yet all the time, all the time through that process, we're avoiding this benchmark that we've drawn here that says, this is, you know, all kinds of red flags go up if it gets worse than this. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole point of, you know, why we, why we uh, monitor the limitation policies, and yet you can see that as long as the measurement isn't crossing the line, um, we wouldn't really spend any more time on that, uh, on the limitation side of that, of that uh, question, right? Because mm -hmm. like not about what we're accomplishing at all. Yes, we did avoid what we're trying to avoid, and then we can like go on to the next thing. Um, so yeah, great, great um, question. Martha, and there's, uh, I think that comes out again when we actually dive into the questions that come up when we're looking at a report. Um, so I just wanted to show this quick, um, this quick calendar, and this is, um, I think, one of those files that is available to you. But you know, you want to be able to look, have an, a, a kind of a bird's eye view of what your monitoring schedule is, and you can see that. A, a lot of these policies are monitored annually. And I just want to point out that it doesn't mean that the uh, expectation is not only in place annually. What we want to say is that the, um, the, the, the expectation is in place all the time, 24-7. And the monitoring is just when we do that checking part. So you rely on the idea that your policies are controlling all the time and that we do a periodic check so that we can, again, going back to the um, definition of accountability, we're just uh, demonstrating that the, I just want to actually click up there, I don't know what this will look like to you here, we're just giving the justifying analysis or explanation to prove um, and a trust is fulfilled or an obligation is met. So that's what's happening on this periodic basis, but the actual control that the board put down is in place all the time. That's a really key idea for people who, especially when they come on the board and, and you know, 
you're not talking about staff treatment at every meeting or you're not talking about financial conditions at every meeting and people wonder you know well why not those things are so important to us and you know you just don't have to talk about them all the time if you have policies that are in place um, the uh, I have a little note here remember to talk about new policies uh, this again might not be the perfect place to throw this in but our team we um, we think about um, policies all the time and we continue to modify our sample set and one of the things that we kind of a seed that we want to plant um, with boards this year is that it's worth investing in really asking the question do you have the policies that you want and we would like to help you with that question uh, using the samples that we have uh, been developing recently because they actually really are different from the policies that were developed say five years ago um, and policies are expensive because uh, managers take them seriously and there's a lot of work that goes on after you hand them off and so we do think it's worthwhile to really freshen up your policies um, from time to time and right now we're actually um, kind of on the verge of having a new edition available for you and um, and yet the question is well why would we do that because our policies are all working for us and the question is that maybe we can actually continue to make our policies and mo and responding monitoring uh, more and more efficient and effective um, okay so that was a little brief commercial Bob do you have something on that or Bentley Oh, Mark, I have a question regarding uh, external and internal reports on that slide. Um, oh, OK. Board, uh, the question has to do is, are external reports only used for financial conditions, or can they be used in other policy well, areas? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, of course, the, the, the audit is the uh, most common example uh, and, and recommendation, re recommended uh, external report. Um, um, the other external monitoring that I have seen is like pretty rare. It actually would be used um, if the board, uh, if if there was uh, almost you would say if there was a breach of trust in in uh, in in the internal process. And what we're trying to create in the internal monitoring process is enough outside content again that 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 need or or uh, requirement almost for uh, demonstration of third-party support integrated into an internal monitoring report so Martha was just talking about current ratio and she was bringing in lots of different kind of data points that could be relevant in a um, uh, in an internal report some of those are probably very valid to continue to include others maybe not but um, my impression is that the more outside uh, third-party review that's invoked in the internal report the the fewer instances of external monitoring will be required outside of the financial audit um, and then my last point on that is that whenever you have a um, um, an external uh, uh, monitoring or a direct uh, monitoring, and a direct would mean that the um, that the board itself is going to go look. Okay, it's going to go check. Uh, both of those cases, so the external and the direct you would still actually want to use the manager's operational definition slash inter interpretation to provide um, what it is that you're checking right so here's an you know an, an example is well let's say you have a staff treatment policy that says hey you need to it's not okay if you treat staff unfairly and the management has developed a operational definition for um, for uh, for fairness around how they um, how they have internalized that and and included in that I would recommend to the manager that they have outside support for why their method uh, should be found to be reasonable 
All right, so it's not just like Mark's opinion that this method for testing fairness should be good, that it would be much uh, a much better presentation to the board if, uh, in, again, in the staff treatment area, that uh, an outside HR consultant, uh, an attorney who, who is familiar with labor law, or the H, someone from the HR industry, for example, um, said that, hey, this process that you're using is good. All right. So now what we've done is the management has actually built underneath the idea of fairness in a way that can be, um, can be measured. And if you're going to do an external check or a direct check, you want to use that measurement. Instead of, for example, hiring someone who says, oh, well, I have my own way of measuring fairness and I'm going to come in from my own different point of view and check, that would be an unfair, um, an unfair process. Um, so you have to really always rely on what the manager has developed for, um, uh, I mean, it, I mean the, the, the question would be to an outside person, first question would be, um, hey, outside person, do you find the manager's uh, interpretation and definition of this to be reasonable? So like we're making that judgment. Uh, the question is, if you were coming in from the outside, would you find this to be reasonable? And then you would go and assess the data to see if actual conditions allow for um, a, a assertion of compliance or not. Does that make sense to uh, uh, those of you who can respond verbally? <laughs> yes. Yeah. i just add that the one other area at Weaver's Way, the board once upon a time discussed the possibility of an external uh, monitoring for the asset protection. Uh -huh. We never did it, though. Yeah, and well. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to well, say we all, that... No, you go ahead, Bob. <laughs> okay. We also discussed uh, external monitoring of ourselves, you know, when we did the G policies, but that's not the, what the subject of this... Yeah, session. good. Right. And the, the examples of asset protection uh, monitoring reports that I've seen, they use a lot of outside support for the rationale. So, in other words, if the policy says, hey, uh, the, it's, it's, uh, it's not okay if our assets are inadequately insured. Instead of the manager saying, oh, well, in my opinion, we're adequately insured, the manager goes out and has a memo presented from a reasonable source that says, we've looked over your assets uh, and insured levels and find you to be adequately insured. And that's built into the internal monitoring process, right? So you're getting kind of the benefit of uh, an external review, but you're actually, um, it's, it's being developed internally so the manager uh, actually knows whether or not, you know, he or she is, is doing the job, right? They have to go outside and, and ask. And another really interesting, simple example of that is if uh, regarding security, um, you know, I don't know anything about security. So if I walked through the store and said, gee, it looks like I see you've got a camera there and locks there looks like your facility is secure and yet down the street there's like Joe's security service who probably has a great form and can walk through and check off the 20 point checklist of what it means to actually be secure the two are you know quite different in terms of uh, of, of effectiveness and so if the board is actually judging on you know Mark's opinion and he's actually a store manager doesn't really under you know isn't the security expert versus actually having a security expert you would um, be you, you would actually feel better about the reasonableness of something that invoked that third party. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. Bentley, anything else there? All right, so here's a calendar. I don't know, uh, this is in the files, but basically you want to see that there's a column here for GM monitoring, and it goes during the year and there's other stuff that the board needs to be doing, and so this is just one slice of board life. Um, so this is just showing the same idea in time, and it's very useful to have a tool like this um, so that uh, especially new directors can see how, um, how policies are monitored you know, during the course of the year. Bob uh, brought up that um, uh, there are board policies that need to be monitored uh, during the year as well, and we're not really talking about that today, but you definitely want to, if you're, if you're not tuned in to 
checking against your expectations uh, on board work. You you ought to be, and um, your CBuild consultant can offer some uh, mechanisms for for doing that. Um, okay, so we're going to kind of walk through the decision tree. This um, this file is available in the file repository. It's kind of a board game. <laughs> Um, and at the end, there's a, a box. If you actually get all the way through, you you get to have cake. So it's worth it's worth going for it. Um, I was reflecting recently when I uh, started on the Brattleboro. I was on the Brattleboro Food Co-op board for seven years. When I was when I started being the uh, the board leader and in charge of uh, of uh, facilitating the meetings. In the beginning, I would we would get to the place where it's the monitoring report, and I would say, "Okay, so everybody has the manager's monitoring report. What do you think?" <laughs> Just like ask kind of a big, open-ended question, and then that wouldn't help anybody do anything, and we'd have kind of a of a wild, wild west conversation, and then luckily maybe get grounded in the end and make a decision. And um, and this process that we're suggesting to you is really different. It's about being efficient in how you ask the questions and how you use your time so that when you um, have an agenda item, you really know why you have it and, and that you can just move through it, um, help, help the board move through it as efficiently as possible. Um, so Martha and Bob, I, I, Bob, you mentioned the decision tree before. Have you, did you find this useful or? Do you remember it all? Yeah, very useful. Uh, I think it was an earlier version, though, than the one I'm looking at now. Yeah. What are those little yellow bubbles that are little in? Little yellow bubbles. Yeah, good. So those are, um, I'm going to click out of um, PowerPoint here. So this will just take a second to recycle the um, image. Hold on one second. Uh, decision tree there. And Mark, while we're going through this, if you could spend a little time on the question about how does a board de de decide what's reasonable? Yeah. The question of determining reasonableness. Yeah, reasonableness. Good. Um, um, so I think that to to do that, will uh, this is the right this is really the right time. So so these in the uh, in the file that's on the repository, I even made some little notes here with some sub questions. So when you hover over these, you get. Uh, uh, additional uh, helpful ideas, <laughs> Bob. So that that's the answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. And just a clarifying question: Does this get done for every policy in the manual? Uh, yes, for every policy that you have delegated to the general manager, which are the policies in the limitation area where you have you have said in advance. All the stuff that's not okay, uh, and also um, uh, your ends policy, which is uh, about what it is you're setting out to accomplish. Okay, so yes, and yet Bob brought up, uh, and I'm I'm kind of piggybacking on that the board process and board GM relations policies. The answer there is yes, you want to have those on your calendar. But we actually have a variety of ways that you can monitor them, and uh, and this uh, decision tree does not really apply specifically to those policies. All right. So uh, this first part here, I say this very well might be the most important part of the decision tree. Did the directors receive the written report in advance of the meeting and come prepared to act? So if you can develop a culture where Board packets are distributed a week ahead of time, and people get into pattern of really reading the reports. And like we describe in the Co-op Grocer article, um, uh, that the report is good enough to make this judgment about reasonableness and check for data and see if there's a um, uh, an ability or see if the person can can agree or disagree with the manager's assertion of compliance, all that can happen before you get to the board meeting. And if you can create that culture, then you don't have a culture of people showing up at the meeting to talk about the report 
what you're really doing is coming to the meeting ready to decide on the report. And that shift is really, really helpful and so helpful that if we answer no to that top box, don't deal with it. <laughs> Just like reschedule it and, and work on creating a culture where you can, you, can, uh, you can actually be successful in having people come to the meeting prepared and ready to act. All right. Um, the next question here is, uh, is the operational definition interpretation reasonable? All right, so here are some sub-questions that I find to be really helpful in answering that question. So first of all, this is a question that every individual director needs to be able to answer. Okay, so this isn't like something that only the whole board can answer. This is an individual uh, question to the individual director. In the end, the whole board has to make a decision, but you want it to be based on what you think as an individual. So the question is, gee, how does the GM know if an expectation has been accomplished? Or in the case of a limitation policy, gee, how does the GM know if clearly we're, we're avoiding this, 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 uh, this boundary? How do we know that, right? What data would be used to demonstrate accomplishment, or let's say avoidance, of a specific board expectation being reported on. So you're asking these questions, you're, you're, you're digging into it like, well, how does, how does the GM actually know if we're avoiding fiscal jeopardy? Or how does the GM actually know if staff is being treated fairly, right? And then uh, the third level there is, why is that methodology um, reasonable? I mean, like, why is that a good idea? Does that approach hold water? Does it make sense to me? Um, should I think it's reasonable? And just by asking those questions, you start to develop a picture of what, what might be reasonable. So if it's, again, if it's Mark's opinion, hey, I did this, uh, that, you know, that's like debatable. Like nine people could debate Mark's opinion. But if I'm invoking uh, an outside standard or I've hired someone to look at our systems and process, and they have, uh, and they have asserted that in fact we have, uh, we we have a good system. Uh, those are types. That's type of information that the GM is going to be building into the report to you, so that you'll have an easier time answering the question: Is this approach reasonable? Because you have to answer the question. And so, if the manager makes it very hard for you, you're going to have a hard time answering it. <laughs> if the manager makes it easy for you, it will be easy. Like, hey. We use the current ratio for this because everybody uses the current ratio, and maybe there's even a little paragraph about about that. Um, now, in your home and your living room, even though if you didn't even know anything about the current ratio, now you do because it was built into the report. This next question is: um, Is there data in the report that directly relates to the measurements that are called for in the interpretation? So the only data in a report should be data that is necessary as called for in this uh, interpretation that we have, that we have uh, hopefully decided is reasonable. In other words, no extraneous data, please. Because um, then that sets us up for this third question, which is, hey, if the operational definition clearly showed us what data is necessary and, and what data would mean, we would need to have to have compliance, when we actually plug in real data, we know the answer whether or not we're in compliance or not. It's not a guessing game. So that's why we set up this kind of digital system so that with a series of yes, no answers, we can really move through these reports. Managers, if they know you're going to use this system, can rely on you. You're still in the judging position, so you know it's not like you've given anything away, but we have kind of created a structure um, that everybody can rely on. So, yeah, go ahead. Mark, Mark this file is available on the Seabuild site or the website, correct? Yeah, it's it's part of the it's files for in this um, uh, for this workshop. Yeah, so everyone can get access to those little bubble questions. Yep, and um, and literally, I have seen whole boards print this out, and certainly when you're getting used to the idea of what are the questions. Um, Everybody has this on the table, and you're just like walking through it and getting used to it. I think in the end, after you practiced, you certainly don't need to, but uh, the ideas are you know very helpful in terms of kind of containing the um, containing the conversation. Um, 
you, you see, one, one thing that's not going on here is we're not saying, uh, we don't have like a tangent where we're saying, gee, if there was something interesting in the report, spend 20 minutes talking about it. <laughs> it's not really on the decision tree. Um, that's, that's, I mean, I have observed and been in many of those conversations where, you know, we could pick up on a thread and talk about it, and then you finally get done with the conversation, and, and actually it didn't affect the board's decision at all, and, and probably didn't even add value to the co-op. It was interesting for some of the people in it. And we're trying to really help you um, kind of regularize your process so that you can have an, uh, intentional conversations about stuff that you plan on talking about as opposed to stuff that just comes up from the manager's report. Um, so you can see here on the left, there's a whole policy reflection part. Part of your do we have the policies that we want uh, comes out of your, um, your monitoring process. Um, and then there's, you'll see on the right, you know, things that happen here if, if, the reason, if it's not reasonable and if there's no data and the data doesn't conform. And I have some examples in, um, of meeting minutes coming up here. Um, that might be more useful. We can actually talk about a couple specifics. So I'm going to switch back over here. Um, and again, as you're trying out, if you haven't been using the decision tree and you try it out, we can all help you with that. Um, so in the handout packet, we're back now on the on the slides. Um, these are the questions um, that were in the bubbles. So underneath the, is it reasonable, the question is, um, gee, how does the manager know if we're good? Uh, what data is going to be needed? And why should we think that that methodology and data um, is reasonable? I mean, it's just like, you just ask the question right out front. Why should we think this is reasonable? That's that's a fair question to ask. Um, is there data? That's a yes, no question. And when we look at the data in, in, in the context of the, um, of, the, uh, of the report, it should then tell us whether or not we're in compliance or not. We've got an example of that coming up. So now I've got a couple of slides here that actually talk about um, uh, like in the board meeting. So if it's true that people came prepared to act, then that's different from like when I described, I first started just saying, well, so what did everybody think about the report? First of all, we, wanted, we, we do want to know uh, that people have read and, and have come to the meeting prepared to act. I see that happen uh, at one board I work with. They actually go around the table before they uh, go into the monitoring process. They, they ask everybody to affirm, have you read the material and are you prepared to act? They take their accountability link very seriously. And, um, and then as I was uh, preparing for the workshop, I was also reading just to build that right into the motion where the motion is, you know, the, we're affirming that we've read the reports and we've come prepared to act. And now we're actually going to um, have a move to accept the um, to accept the report and so in the minutes you would actually include this language and of course that is to show and demonstrate your duty of care in the situation <laughs> so um, just to lighten things up a little bit here's my um, um, oh it's taking a really long time to load so here's here's the point of operational definitions so the guy says, our troubles are over, coach. I found us a seven-footer. <laughs> and it's because the guy's got seven feet. <laughs> so the point there is that, so, so here's coming back to the reasonableness issue. Um, everything is open to interpretation. So let's say, going back to Martha's example at their board where they, they talked about uh, avoiding fiscal jeopardy and, in particular, uh, liquidity. Or another one that seems like, well, how could you ever measure, uh, hey, it's not okay if staff are treated unfairly. And the point is, is that we need to move into uh, a context that can be measured 
And here's a case where it just is kind of still wide open. So you can imagine if we had nine people, uh, of course, in this case, it would be hard to imagine a lot of different ways that you can interpret having a seven footer. But if everybody sitting around the room is using their own way of judging, then you've kind of got the wild, wild west. So what we're saying is, look, after you have the board's voice, now what we're going to do is all focus on the manager's response, and we're going to judge it for reasonableness, and we're going to see if, if, if the way it's describing, and in this case, uh, hey, go find me a seven-footer, <laughs> actually uh, it, uh, holds water. So in this case, the coach obviously um, didn't adequately operationalize uh, um, seven-footer. <laughs> um, this next slide might be very hard to read on the handout because I, I just kind of put it all in here, but it is, um, it is a separate Word doc in the, um, in the files. And what I thought would be useful is just to have some sample board meeting language. Because I, um, I see that, well, how do, we, you know, how do we say, you know, how do we just write down what we did? So here's an example. This would be in the board meeting minutes. The board accepted the GM's internal monitoring report for its financial conditions and activity policy. Okay, so there would be like a, that could almost be a period, end of story. But now I'm going to actually add to it, uh, finding it to include reasonable operational definitions, interpretation, and evidence to support the GM's assertion of compliance. Okay, so the GM in the report is going to assert compliance or acknowledge non-compliance. Okay, so that's actually what's in the report, and the board is deciding whether or not it buys that or not. So the action is really about um, were we able to buy the GM's assertion of compliance, and what's that based on? And this particular sentence is saying it was based on evidence and reasonableness of the interpretations, right? So to me, that's a very full um, description of a board action. In the next iteration, I'm saying, well, we accepted it except for item 2.4, where the board accepts the explanation for noncompliance with this item and the commitment to achieve compliance by such and such a date. So this would be a case where Let's say that you know, and it was a financial conditions policy, and it's it's got quite an elaborate uh, report, and some of it is because of the board has had uh, more than four or at least four sub policies, and this 2.4 is out of compliance, and the GM wrote that into the report, because the great thing is that the manager, as the author of the report, because he or she is saying. Uh, I mean, is fully aware of how compliance is measured, is going to be able to write down if there's a non-compliance situation. Whenever that happens, the manager is responsible for including a plan for uh, coming back into compliance, including a date. So this minutes, th this particular uh, sample is saying that, hey, in that report, there was an out of compliance situation it was acknowledged, we accept that, it's on the table, and we are okay with a commitment, which is just, you know, not even just saying, hey, and the manager's gonna try and get us back in compliance by a certain date. Um, another version is, uh, hey, we actually didn't buy the interpretation as being reasonable. We found it, we just, we're not buying it. We thought it was unreasonable. It needs further development, and we're going to schedule some follow-up monitoring on such and such a date. So this would, you know, have been p potentially in response to a report that where the manager is submitting it, he thinks he or she thinks everything's fine, but the board just found that, you know, look, this is just your opinion. We can't really rely on this. If we had to stand up in front of our members and say that the way that we're accountable for whatever is because of this we are not comfortable. So we're finding it unreasonable. Keep, go back and do some more work. Um, that's not saying the manager is a bad person. That's just saying that in terms of the accountability link, it's not fully developed yet. Uh, let's see. 
Here, we found the GM to be in non-compliance. We're disagreeing with the assertion and compliance is required by such and such a date. Follow-up schedule. Okay, so here, this is, a, I would say, you know, more of a, uh, the board is really now asserting some control in a situation where the GM is asserting compliance. The board is not buying it. We're disagreeing. And in fact, we're going we're gonna to be pretty firm here about what our requirement is and, um, and, follow, and scheduling follow-up monitoring. Here we're actually, now that was actually just for a sub-policy. In this, in this sample here, we're saying that uh, we rejected the report. The material in it was, uh, did not meet our expectations, unreasonable ex uh, interpretations or lack of evidence to support any assertion of compliance. So this would be like a report that just said, I did this, I did this, I did this. And you know, that happens. I've seen those reports and I think the best thing to do is just to turn them back and say it's just not good enough. Any, uh, Bob, uh, Martha, any comments on uh, minutes, samples? Uh, I guess the only comment would be that uh, if you're really rejecting the uh, report on the data, like uh, I guess the last paragraph that it says except for item 2.4, Yes. Um, would, would you want to? I would think that maybe in the minutes you would you'd want to say why or how or what the disagreement was that the general manager said it was compliance and the board said no, it's not in compliance. So yeah. It'd probably be some. You know, it might be helpful to put details in the minutes. Yep, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's actually. An interesting case. It's 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 kind of difficult. Um, I haven't seen many cases where you know if the manager is actually providing a well-developed uh, interpretation and data that it ought to be really straightforward about the assertion of compliance. So a disagreement on the assertion is is um, is hard is hard to get there. I think it's it's more likely this last one where the it just is underdeveloped, or there's no data, yeah. and then it's just not going to—it's just not going to you know, hold up. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so here's a sample. Uh, this is actually on the um, um, in the financial conditions area. So, and again, this is a sub policy. So it's just a snippet out of out of uh, limitation policy regarding financial conditions so that the top level policy would say something like hey it's not okay if um, uh, it's not okay if uh, you risk fiscal jeopardy and then a sub part of that would be this policy which is um, hey it's not okay if you allow liquidity um, to be insufficient okay so that's the board's voice and first of all I just want to point out this is a case where this is a non-specific uh, policy. In other words, it doesn't say we require you to have a current ratio of some number. My personal opinion, from the board's point of view, this is a this is a powerful. The non-specific policy is very powerful policy. So if you have policies where you have put in a lot of numbers, um, just know that you're taking responsibility that those are the right numbers. And uh, you know, and if they were put in there three years ago, and you don't really know how they got there, in my mind, that's really not good enough because those numbers are really important. So what's happening in this policy is the board is not including any numbers. It's using this idea of, hey, it's not okay if liquidity is insufficient. Now what we see is that the manager is coming in saying, look, I'm going to set a benchmark of one to 1.25, which is this number right here. And I'm using that number because it's an NCGA benchmark, and it also happens to be, and I'm just making this up, it happens to be um, a covenant in our loan agreement. So there's two reasons why this should be a reasonable benchmark for, um, for liquidity, all right? And there it is right there, the red line, and then this line, green line, is showing actual data. 
So as long as the green line stays above the red line, we have compliance. And we've set up a situation where it ought not be like any, any board discussion is based up here on the interpretation. Are these, um, is the rationale and support that's being used to set the current ratio at 1 to 1.25 reasonable? Right? So if I had a little poll, we'd ask, what do you all think? And, um, and I, if I were on a board, I would say that a benchmark set with the, in, as a co-op standard and also the same number used in the loan agreement, um, I, would, I would buy that. How about uh, Martha and Bob? Do you guys buy that? Yes, I buy it. And it's actually a pretty high number, one uh, one point two five as a as a as a low end benchmark for a current ratio is. Um, I mean, you know, I I know co-ops that work with uh, a one point or even some under a one point. So it's actually a, a I'm in a high number. So, but of course, some people would say, oh, I don't know, I want to be very conservative, so I want a higher current ratio. And so this is where the manager is actually coming in with some support of why 1 to 1.25 is a good number because you could have a range of, of, um, of ideas at the board level of what would be acceptable. In other words, it's not actually about what people want, <laughs> like what their favorite current ratio is. It's what's reasonable. And so here's two reasons why we should find this to be reasonable. Um, so now I have, um, let's see, a, a, an example of an ENDS monitoring report. And um, um, I just want to show the difference. Um, basically, in a limitation monitoring report, it's, ba it's always almost this easy. But there's some benchmark, and you're looking for data points on one side of that line or not, or the other, depending on how it works. And it's a black and white, yes, no kind of situation. Um, I made up this ENDS policy. It's talking about access to locally and regionally produced food, which is a subpart of you know some other idea of a cooperative commerce for the benefit of members. And then the board was more specific around access to locally and regionally, regionally produced food. The manager produced an operational definition. This would be an early, uh, an early version, which is saying that, hey, we're going to have increased access, and we're going to have short-term and long-term strategies to measure it. Right? So there's level one of uh, operational definition. Um, short-term outcomes are we're going to have systems in place to measure sales based on origin. I mean, a few years ago, it just wasn't even on the radar. Now that would be uh, a good first level outcome uh, that a manager might bring into an ENDS monitoring report. Um, and this will be, I'm switching the page here. There's a couple of other ideas that says, hey, we're going to measure, we're going to start to measure sales in our store of fresh produce. We're going to measure local, a number of local and regional food producers local and regional food products, and total sales volume. And then probably in the end, we're going to have goals for each of these that will be multi-year. Um, this manager also is taking some responsibility for um, supporting local CSAs, measuring CSAs in the region, CSA subscribers, and total sales volume in CSAs. That, you know, and then also putting a caveat that hey, we can't actually take responsibility for that, but we can try and influence its success. Um, uh, Multi-year concepts, one to five years. This, this actually example is about learning stuff in conjunction with the extension service. And so there's kind of a long-term uh, outcome in response to the board's policy. And then in your report, not only would you get that kind of narrative, but what you're looking for is, um, did we do this? You know, do we now have ability to measure uh, sales? Yes. Are we on track for long-term accomplishment? So here's the difference now in an ENDS report and a limitation report. Um, with the with the uh, ENDS report, you're also you're not only 
measuring um, what happened, but also are we on track for this longer term accomplishment? All right. So in this case, there were um, one, two, three, four different um, measurements, uh, internal systems, focus on progress in in-store sales, focus on progress in CSA strategic partnership, and focusing on the learning. So this is, you know, kind of a quick and dirty, I would give this, uh, you know, um, a, a C plus uh, in terms of having, uh, you know, some strategies and some, some data, um, but since it's all made up, I, um, maybe I'd give it A for made up, but C plus in real life. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you see the difference between do we actually have, like what happened this year versus are we on track for long-term accomplishment? That's the major difference in the, um, uh, between the two types of reports. Um, this is another way that I, I demo it when I'm working with managers is just like, okay, we're going to have these, in that case, we had four different threads of um, strategic process and um, each year we're going to measure uh, some so that we can actually say, look, here's the progress that we made and we're talking about outcomes here. We're not having long lists of activities. We're talking about, look, we want to get from point A to point B and then when we're looking at, say, a five-year window, we know that we want to be here. So an ends monitoring report, you're getting this part and also are we on track? So Bob, that's that's the current um, kind of structure of thinking about the ends monitoring report. You wanted to make sure we touched on that. Yeah, I like that. And then the other thing is, is that there's another, there's two times a year when a board gets this type of information. One is um, in the ends monitoring report and then the other is usually in the um, limitation, um, uh, it's a limitation policy on planning. So that policy usually says something like, hey, it's not okay if you don't have plans. And then you wouldn't be getting, um, like you wouldn't get this about what we've accomplished, but you would be getting the operational definition, which is the target for accomplishment, which is maybe even out here. And you would be getting what the trajectory is. And then you would, um, again, depending on, and of course this is totally dependent on the planning process used by your management team, but um, you might have an annual business plan of 12 months and, and a three to five year plan that would have more like, instead of like specifics, it might be more of just the, the strategies that are, that are under development. But you're getting a sense from, a, from an owner's point of view that board policies are driving the train and that they have been operationalized and that they are actually guiding the planning process which that is a different um, topic, but it is actually when you're on the board and you're getting those two monitoring reports, the planning monitoring report and the ends monitoring report, those are really good times to pay attention to that information. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly show a couple of charts here. Uh, this one is, and these are all available on the file repository. This one is, is a, um, how you keep track of what the board did over the course of the year as it related to its, um, so here are the policies and here's the schedule and the date it received it and was it submitted on time? Did we find it reasonable? Was there data? Were we in, did we agree it was in compliance? And any comments? If you keep something like this during the year, it's really helpful for you when you go to do the GM evaluation. Um, and then this last page that I'll show you is the memo that I really uh, like. I think it's a simple way to kind of get that GM evaluation going, have a secretary or someone on the board um, who's responsible for maintaining that table, write a memo to the board that creates kind of an official affirmation of the board's um, decisions regarding the monitoring process during the year. And that's then really is the GM evaluation and you just attach the table and, um, and then have a little, have a little party, <laughs> have some cake. Um, so, um, Martha, anything to chime in on? 
no, on that no, last. It's, it's, we have our um, admin assistant compile all that for us, so yeah, it's good. pretty busy at the, the year end. Yeah, and do you have somebody write a memo like this? Uh, yes. Yeah, good. So in theory, all the directors might keep their own table during the year, but it's really handy if if um, if you have kind of you can have an an official version at the end so that it's really clear this is actually the record. Um, Bob, any um, any comments from you on that last part? Oops. No, no, I like it. We follow pretty much a, a similar approach. Mm -hmm. Bentley, any lingering questions there? Oh, I hope not. I think we've tried to get most of them if they come. If, if people did have questions that didn't get answers, if they could send them again. One question had to do with, has, have you ever seen a board successfully use a consent agenda on these monitored reports? That's a great question. Um, and Yes, I've seen it. Yes, it can work. And it does have an effect of kind of removing the board one step away from the whole process. So what we actually recommend is go ahead and schedule five minutes per report. It doesn't add up to a lot of time. And it does allow for that little social interaction um, regarding the whole reporting process that, that you know, just as humans, we value so much. And so instead of kind of removing it, uh, you still allow for it, just contain it by really keeping everybody on track. So that's a yes, but. <laughs> yeah, and then, then Tom asks uh, if sometimes we would actually look at, um, sometimes you, you would actually look at just activities rather than results when we're in the process of achieve, implementing a system to achieve an outcome. Yeah, but but. Not very often. I would say, um, and you're not going to see it in a report, you might see it in the FYI from a manager. That the idea of actually having, uh, um, you, you know, where it's going to come up is it's going to be part of a strategic development plan, but um, there are so many activities that, that add up to accomplishment that only, the manager is probably only going to bring to the board, um, you know, some for, for who knows what reason. You, you really end up out of the activity game altogether. And certainly, your job is not to be helpful um, in designing programs and activity. That's, <laughs> we've taken you out of that position, really. I mean, I say we. I'm talking about when you're in the governance position, you're, you're really not in the, the helpful mode. So really, Bentley, is that about it from you for questions? I think it is. Okay. Well, listen, we're four minutes over. I apologize for that. I hope that you all honor uh, honor ending your meetings on time. It's a very good thing to do for your directors. Um, we have two more of these sessions coming up this month. Uh, next week, Carolee Coulter and I will be uh, reviewing and presenting the GM compensation process that, uh, that has been developed and that was in the Corp Grocer a couple of... Uh, maybe the last issue. And then the week after this, uh, Marilyn Scholl will be presenting on um, member economic participation. So those are going to be uh, those are going to be really great sessions. I'm looking forward to myself. I hope you guys come back. If you have any questions about technically finding the files, whatever, feel free to email, email me. If you have questions about any of the content that we covered today, um, your CBIL consultant is ready to receive your questions. <laughs> And, uh, and looking forward to helping you. Uh, I'd like to thank Martha. Thank you, Martha. You're welcome. I learned some good stuff. Cool. And Bob, thank you. Thanks, Mark. And Bentley, thank you. And, <laughs> and now uh, one last little thing. When we end the session, you are going to have come up on your screen a brief evaluation form. And uh, please fill that out because we value your input and have a lot of these sessions that we're going to be producing over the next few years. And, and what you tell us is going to really help us uh, design them. So um, there you have it. Thanks so much.